This is the ethics portion of this lecture. Let's go ahead and get started. So the ethics code is broken down into not only different sections, but there's mandatory ethics, there's aspirational ethics. So let's explore what these are. Mandatory ethics, this deals with the minimum level of professional practice. So this is the bare minimum that everyone, if you're shooting for the bare minimum, should be doing. Whereas aspirational ethics involves the highest standard of thinking and conduct. And aspirational ethics is really what we're shooting for in terms of wanting to make sure that we provide the best practice to our clients or the best services to our clients, that we're making sure that we're taking care of our clients in the best way possible, those types of things. And then positive ethics is an approach taken by practitioners who want to do their best for clients rather than simply meeting the minimum standards, basically to stay out of trouble. Informed consent and confidentiality is are often used interchangeably, but they are different, so let's discuss them. Informed consent involves the right the client has to be informed about their therapy, and it involves their ability to make autonomous decisions regarding the treatment that they are going to receive. This includes factors such as our responsibilities as the therapist, it involves their responsibilities as the client, it involves any fees that might be involved, uh, in terms of treatment, it involves the services that the client can expect to receive, such as what type of therapy we're going to be using. It involves the length of treatment. So for example, are you going to be seeing this individual for 10 sessions, for 15 sessions, for 35 sessions? And it involves our qualifications as therapists. So for example, what is our level of training, bachelor's, master's, doctorate, any additional certifications or say special training with uh, some specific population. All of that information co is involved in informed consent. And um, the last thing that I'll say about that in terms of informed consent is it also involves any risks. So for example, if I were to, uh, if I were to want to use some type of uh, cutting edge new therapy I would want to run that by the client, right? I would want to say, hey, something to the effect of there's this new treatment out there. There's not a ton of research on it. We don't know if it will work or not, but here's the information that I do know. And then, you know, basically put the ball in the client's court to be able to make a decision on whether or not based on the information, if they want to use that treatment or if they want to use something that has already been well researched. Confidentiality is our legal duty to keep the client's information private and not disclose that information or not share that information with just anybody who asks. So there are exceptions to this, right? And I think this Breaking Bad video does a pretty good job of covering this. So I will usually say something to the effect of, hey, mini Vegas rules here. Uh, you have privacy and confidentiality with some exceptions. So that's thoughts of harm or killing yourself or anyone else. And since I'm a mandated reporter, that also covers any type of abuse of vulnerable individuals, such as children or elderly. And then I'll usually ask if they have any questions and then we'll go from there. Usually that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and most people are like, nope, 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 that doesn't apply to me. I'm good to go. I don't have any questions. In terms of covering this information, you want to do it as quickly and as soon as possible. Because imagine that if you wait until, say, the end of the session um, and say a client has come in and they're suicidal and you're like, oh, hey, by the way, you mentioned you were suicidal. I have to let my supervisor know. Like it might put the client in a situation where they're like, oh, well, I shared that information with you and I thought you weren't going to tell anybody. And now you're telling me that you're going to go, you know, run it by your supervisor or that type of thing. So it's just better to cover all of that information either at the very beginning, say your very first session with the client. Um, that way you avoid those types of situations where they're like, oh, I, I didn't realize that you were going to share this information. But again, it's those few exceptions where someone's either suicidal, homicidal, or they disclose that some type of abuse is going on. So it, it doesn't tend to happen or come up very often. In terms of getting informed consent or, or uh, confidentiality, those types of things will also usually, depending on what setting you're in, but most settings will not only get this in as a written consent, so have someone actually sign something 
when they're starting treatment, but also verbal. So I just covered the verbal. It's just to make sure that people understand what the piece of paper or the document is actually saying. And then depending on just kind of to, to wrap all of this up, depending on where you are as a therapist, I will also add in something about relationships as part of confidentiality. So for example, if you're in a really small town where everyone knows everybody, I just to try and keep things from being awkward, I will usually say something like, hey, it's a small town. We're probably going to run into each other at the gym or the grocery store or whatever. I won't approach you because I don't want to put you in a situation where um, you feel uncomfortable. And I also don't want to put you in a situation where um, you know, I might accidentally breach your confidentiality or break your confidentiality. For example, you know, if I were to walk up to you at the grocery store and say, hey, how are you? It's great to see you. You know, that might put you in a situation where, you know, Sally or Joe or whoever is like, oh, how do you know that person? And so just to avoid doing that, I won't approach you, but you're more than welcome to approach me if you want to come say hi. So just to kind of wrap that up in terms of how I ha handle confidentiality and make sure that um, I'm not putting the client in a situation if I am at, you know, in a small town where I might accidentally disclose that they're my client. Want to avoid doing that. So priorities. Of course, in this type of relationship, the client's priorities and needs are prioritized and they come first. There are some exceptions to that, right? And so this is, again, we talked about awareness in the first part of this lecture, 2A, where we want to make sure that we have self-awareness and, and know what our needs are so that our needs aren't negatively impacting therapy. So an example of this is when I was on practicum in grad school, one of my supervisors, uh, her, sub, her daughter suddenly became very sick, needed emergency surgery. You can imagine in that type of situation, my supervisor was in not in the mental state to provide therapy, to provide supervision, to do anything that was work related. And so she was basically out of work for like three to four weeks as she kind of dealt with this family situation and what was going on. Um, and I think that that's very appropriate, right, for her to basically say, hey, I don't have the mental, emotional capacity to be at work right now. I need to go focus on this thing. And so knowing, again, that self-awareness of, hey, when do I need to take a step back and say, hey, I've got whatever else going on in my personal life. I can't be present to, you know, provide therapy or to provide supervision or just to be a good employee in general. So being aware of those things is really important. The ethics code, we won't dive into the ethics code itself, but it is good to know that it exists and that there are several different versions depending on where you're at, depending on uh, what, you know, sp uh, specialization you decide to go into. So, for example, up here, I have the American Psychological Association Ethics Code, and this is what governs psychologists um, across the nation. And then on the right, I have pictured the American Counseling Association. So if you're a counselor, this is the ethics code that would govern you as a counselor. And of course, it's going to be the same as if you're a psychiatrist, they have their ethics code. And depending on what state you're in, most states uh, licensing boards also have their own ethics code. So you've got like overall ethics code and then you've got state codes. So making sure that you know what those ethics codes are for both your state and the national level and making sure that you're abiding by those things is hugely important. We talked about um, being a culturally competent therapist a little bit earlier in the previous lecture or in 2A. And so, of course, that's going to come up in ethics as well. Uh, what is your client's worldview and how will that impact his or her decisions? So in this discussion post this week, we talked about values. That's one of the discussions that you guys are going to be writing about. And of course, it's important to be aware of current therapy approaches and how those therapy approaches are maybe grounded in certain values. So for example, uh, you know, famous theorist Freud, Beck, uh, their theorists were developed in Europe and in the U.S. And as Americans, we tend to value individualism. And that's something that is 
really important to us. Whereas other countries, say for example, as you can see here in the graph, Asian countries tend to value more collectivist approaches. And so to be a competent therapist, to be an ethical therapist, we want to make sure that we're avoiding uh, making preconceived assumptions about our clients uh, or that we're, as we talked about earlier, that we're trying to force our values onto our clients, those types of things. All of that also ties into, you know, competence, ethical, kind of go hand in hand here. The textbook discusses assessment and diagnosis, and this is also really important. So asking about culture and background, we've kind of already talked about how those things are important because they tie into worldview and they're, of course, going to tie into how you might diagnose somebody. Uh, an example of this is a couple years ago, I was working with somebody um, not a, a coworker, and you know we're we're joking back and forth, and I said something about him. He's for context, he's a really tall white guy, and I said something about him being white, and he was like, "Dude, I'm half white and I'm half Mexican," and so it it, it was a situation that stood out to me, where of course that was me making an assu an assumption about him and who he is, based on his looks, and I thought about well, what would have happened if I had made that assumption in therapy or with a client. And so again, right, even though I'm working in the field, there's always this situation where we want to make sure that we're checking our own biases, that we're checking uh, whatever we have going on and making sure that we're being careful not to make assumptions about our clients, that we're being ethical and that we're being competent. Um, and so sometimes what therapists or practitioners will do is hugely unethical is they will diagnose purely to make sure that uh, the session is covered in, in via insurance for insurance purposes and that can lead to an ethical dilemma because you're basically making a diagnosis to make sure that your bills are paid we definitely want to stay away from that something else to pay attention to and i know we haven't gotten into the modalities but sometimes different ethical orientations depending on what the orientation or the theorist's beliefs or approaches, they might avoid ethics, uh, sorry, they might avoid making a diagnosis. And so sometimes that can, depending on the situation or depending on what's going on, that can also, uh, ha could potentially cause issues as well. Evidence-based practice has become increasingly popular in recent years, and there's pros and cons on both sides. What I will say about this, and, and I won't spend a lot of time here, is the positive in terms of evidence-based practice is that it has been thoroughly researched. It has been empirically validated by research. It tends to be very standardized, which is sometimes a downside for a therapist. You know, it's a con for them in terms of, well, you know, it's so standardized. It feels so rigid. I have to follow this manual to a T for this to work. And sometimes that results in therapists not wanting to use a manualized or an evidence-based practice um, or an evidence-based approach. In terms of evidence-based practice or an evidence-based approach, it does enhance the overall effectiveness of client services because you're using something that it's oftentimes manualized, not often, but most of the time it's manualized. And so through it being manualized, a lot of research has been done to show if you follow this step and then this step and then this step, most of the clients that we've used this with do get results. Uh, so that's all that I'll say about that in terms of evidence-based practice. Multiple relationships. So this is something important to cover in terms of ethics. So. Of course, we as therapists, we want to make sure that we're being professional, that we're being objective, that we're protecting our clients and, you know, helping our clients meet their goals, move towards getting better and improving. But when we move into situations where we're not, uh, where things are maybe becoming more informal, we put ourselves at risk of being unable to remain objective in the situation. So for example, if we start to become friends with the clients, with our clients, or if we start to cross boundaries, that's where things can really start to get questionable really fast. So here's a, uh, here's an ethical dilemma. Here's an example. A newly licensed psychotherapist, Dr. Parker was attending a dinner party 
Uh, so that's why I've got the picture here with two uh, cute dogs. He was attending a dinner party given by an, a college friend. And the host introduced him to another guest who said, oh, I know you. You're my neighbor Renee's therapist. She talks all the time about you. You're great. You know, I, she said that she just saw you yesterday. How are things going in therapy? What would you do in this situation? What would you say? Well, you want to be really careful and tread really light here, here. Because it's a breach of confidentiality. It's an ethical uh, violation if you say, oh, yeah, Renee's great. She's doing awesome. You can basically neither confirm nor deny that she is your client because of confidentiality and because of protecting her information. So Dr. Parker in this situation needs to tread very lightly and be really careful about what he says. And that's in conflict of a normal kind of social interaction where you would say, you know, oh, how's Peggy or Joe or Sam or whoever? Oh, they're great. You know, I saw them the other day. They're doing fine. Outside of therapy, that would be very normal. But you need to make sure that you're protecting your client's confidentiality and protecting their privacy. Uh, in terms of relationships, we want to make sure that we're as much as possible. Oftentimes, now there might be a few specific exceptions. We won't talk about those. But for the most part, we want to avoid multiple relationships. And multiple relationships being situations where, say... Um, you are seeing someone in therapy and you also, uh, what's an example? You also interact with them for your child's, uh, soccer games. You want to make sure that you're not in these dual relationships because it can really make things maybe confusing for the client and it can really make the water really muddy. So, there are a couple different ways to try and minimize relationships and to make sure that we're setting healthy boundaries. One would be uh, if I have a client, I'm not going to, if that client adds me on social media, I'm not going to accept their request. And that's something that I would talk to them about in therapy, but that could put uh, me as the therapist in a really awkward situation. If say the client sees something on my social media and then they're they come in and they're like, hey, you know, you were you were hypocritical in therapy because you said this, but then on social media you're doing this or that type of situation. Um, and so that's one way to avoid dual relationships or um, multiple relationships is just don't add individuals who are your clients on social media. Another example is having some type of formal decision-making process so that you don't have to rely on how you're feeling in the moment you can say okay what's the how do I normally make ethical decisions in this situation let me follow that process or let me follow those steps and by doing so I will stick to my ethics and stick to making decisions that are best for the client not best for me as as a, an individual and of course we always want to consult with a supervisor with a coworker. Um, and say, hey, I have this situation. Let me just run this by you. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing something. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that because of the nature of therapy, that we keep our relationships with clients professional. Now, again, there might be situations or exceptions to this, but generally speaking, we don't want to have our client relationships move into an, a non-professional uh, situation such as for example I would probably never meet with a client for lunch right lunch is more of a, a non-professional more of a relaxed situation that's something that I would avoid unless there was some really specific situation or exception going on um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head maybe if you were a therapist depending on your orientation where you're like okay as part of therapy maybe say social interaction or social exposure we're going to you know we're going to do a working lunch or something like that and, and get you you know out of your house maybe if the client is experiencing social anxiety and they never want to leave their house like this is part of your therapy we're going to maybe but even that is for me at least would would really be stretching it so avoid multiple relationships it helps keep you out of ethical dilemmas that you don't want to be in, such as the one that Dr. Parker found himself in. So I wanted to throw in 
most common violations because I remember being a grad student and thinking like, oh, there's all these ethical dilemmas. I like, and it, it was kind of this fear of I'm going to lose my license before I even get it. And so I was like, all right, let me just look at this and, and take some of the fear out of this because most common violations based on this research done in 2017 are situations that you should be able to avoid if you just do those aspirational ethics, if you just do what you're supposed to be doing and try to be the best that you possibly can be. So for example, failing to meet CE requirements, I, what? Like most states, every state I believe, has, F, has CE requirements. So for example, the state that I'm licensed in, every, I think, two years, I have to submit uh, 30 CEs for the past two years to show, hey, I'm continuing education credits. I have continued to be a lifelong learner and I've learned about, you know, these things and I submit those CE uh, certifications to them. It's really easy to get to 30 over the course of two years. And so to have to fail that is like, no, what, what? What? Uh, so this research, um, let me talk a little bit more about the research before I talk about some of the other violations, was conducted over five years across uh, 28 different states. So from 2009 to 2013. So this is a little dated given that it's 2023. The authors did attempt to survey all states, but some states are still paper-based. I know that's crazy in 2023. Uh, but some state licensing boards at least have maybe not updated. And so they weren't able to get all state information. They were only able to get state of information for states who are operating online. Door relationships, we just talked about that one. Something that we want to avoid, which keeps us out of ethical situations. So this doesn't talk about what those dual relationships were, but it's 17% at least of the violations that they came across in terms of this study. So again, if you just set healthy boundaries, you're likely going to avoid most dilemmas involving this specific category. Unprofessional conduct, we just talked about that as well. Be professional, you will probably avoid most situations or not. Uh, these situations won't come up if you're a professional. Um, Providing counseling without a proper license, why would you do that? Make sure that you're licensed. Again, aspirational in terms of ethics, make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. If you know that you can't provide therapy without a license, then go get licensed. Convicted of non-counseling related crime. Um, and then disciplinary action. So, so even if you were to get some kind of ethical, you know, like slap on the wrist or, or ding against you, most of these disciplinary actions seem like, okay, let me be an adult, let me take responsibility, let me handle these things uh, in terms of the fine, in terms of going and doing continuing education or in terms of whatever that reprimand is. So for the most part, right, it's, it's not like, I don't know, it's not like you're in most situations, it's not like you're going to go to jail if you have an, if you have a, an ethical violation. It's not like the police are going to run up to your house and, and take you away. Um, not that that should deter you, right? Or, or not that that should be like, oh, well, the disciplinary action isn't that serious. Let me just do what I want. No, we always want to make sure that we're being ethical in terms of our approach as therapists and in terms of our actions and behaviors. And then this research, just a little bit more data here. Again, this one is pretty outdated, but they found some similar common ethical issues. Again, you see the professional relationships if you're having sex with your client, that's hugely unethical, should not be doing that. Dual relationships, again, is one of the biggest things here. And we just talked about informed consent. So as long as you're making sure that you're providing informed consent, that you're providing confidentiality, those are some of the biggest things on the slide here. And then consult, consult, consult. That's the biggest thing that you can do. And one of the most important things that you can do in terms of protecting protecting yourself from ethical dilemmas. So I, I will very often, even at this point in my career, I will talk to a colleague or a coworker and say, hey, I just want to run you by this by you and I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. It's really easy to do that. 
It's really easy to run the situation, whatever it is. Hey, I've got this client with this and this and this going on. And then they give me their opinion or their thoughts. And then usually it's like, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Or, oh, I didn't even think about that. I'm really glad that I brought this up to you. So for me, it's way better to consult. Um, and, and I really like the phrase. I recently heard this at a conference, something to the effect of it's better to uh, not worry alone or be alone in your worrying. So basically it's better to consult and run things by a coworker or a supervisor or someone else in your in the field who is knowledgeable about these types of situations versus you just stressing by yourself and saying, oh, did I handle that right? Did I handle that wrong? I don't know. Just consult and then make sure that you're documenting. And these are the discussion questions which you saw in the previous lecture. And here are my references. And that's it for this week's lecture.